This is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 25. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Verse 15, for it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people. Do not use your freedom as a cover up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God, honor the emperor. Verse 18, slaves in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Verse 22, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. For by his wounds you have been healed, for you were like his sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I hope y'all are repeating that with me. As one of the fundamentally foremost writers of 20th century African American literature, steeped in anthropological and ethnographic research, and having penned classic books like Dust Tracks on a Road, a memoir, Zora Neale Hurston was a genuine, bona fide firecracker. Such a seminal figure in what became known as the Harlem Renaissance, her sage, ingenious, courageous reservoir of a mind is a gift, stamped into perpetuity through a rich catalog of writings that we should share often. In Their Eyes Were Watching God, she writes that if you are silent about your pain, they'll kill you and say you enjoyed it. But there's also this, a declarative reflection from a 1928 essay. This is what she writes. I am not tragically colored. There is no great sorrow damned up in my soul, nor lurking behind my eyes. I do not mind at all. I do not belong to the sobbing school of Negrohood who hold the nature somehow that has given them a low down dirty deal and whose feelings are all hurt about it. Even in the helter skelter skirmish that is my life, she writes, I have seen that the world is to the strong regardless of a little pigmentation more or less. No, I do not weep at the world. I am too busy sharpening my oyster knife. In Narrative of the Life 
of an American slave, which hit the presses in 1845, Frederick Douglass, a devout follower of Jesus himself, challenged the functional yet fraudulent Christianity of the state or dominant culture of the times, writing these words. I love the pure, peaceable, and impartial Christianity of Christ. I therefore hate the corrupt, slave-holding, women-whipping, cradle-plundering, partial, and hypocritical Christianity of this land. Indeed, I can see no reason by the most deceitful one for calling the religion of this land Christianity. I look upon it as the climax of all misnomers, the boldest of all frauds, and the grossest of all libels. The scripture before us today is easy to understand in one sense and in another demands extra effort to grasp. Verses 11 through 17 are standard and straightforward enough. These believers who find themselves in hostile territory are implored to meekly distinguish themselves as foreigners and exiles who abstain from sinful desires. I mean, to be clear, certainly they're no better than the pagan neighbors who live down the street with the new roof that was put on their townhouse. They're no better than those who, like them, risk life and limb during weekly Costco trips. They're no better than their pagan neighbors who hope to make it home without having suffered a shopping cart injury at the store, who bicker and banter and unenthusiastically pay bills and taxes and have shown themselves to be ripe with impatience. They're no better than their pagan neighbors. Regardless, though, of what they arrive holding at life's show and tell exhibition, all that many of them can do is hope to not get hassled or hustled, to keep their head above water, to make a way when they can. They are regular, ordinary people, all of them, one to another. But due to their salvific repositioning, these exiled disciples, those following Jesus are now drawn to a life of holiness, one that obliges them to combat the sin within that is, is so desperate to get out and party. Being people of words and deeds, faith and works, right belief and right action, verse 12, their living testimony is meant to be so synchronous and so true that despite enmity, upon observing and interacting with them, these Christians, the world in their midst will have seen and felt God, no matter what their response to that experience may be. This feels digestible, does it not? It feels like something we can understand. Verses 13 through 17 discuss submitting oneself to every human authority, who, whoever they may be, which, you know, for many of us may summon thoughts of everyone from Chick-fil-A, uh, maybe a shift manager who's reminding their excited team members to complete each customer interaction with the trademark phrase, my pleasure. All the way to the professor who is teaching on a Zoom screen full of disillusioned students, all the way to a parent or guardian who's setting boundaries for their children, to the police officer even, who's commanding someone that's been pulled over, who has an outstanding arrest warrant to place their hands behind their back, to interlock their fingers and spread their feet. To reasonable-minded folks, that, fears fair, that feels fair enough. It feels essential. We recognize that without a chain of command in life, whereby hierarchy concerning authority, not never innate value, never innate worth, is an established rule, without any of that, anarchy will run the day. Peter instructs these castaway citizens who follow the way, meaning Jesus, verse 17, to show proper respect to everyone. Love 
the family of believers, fear God, honor the emperor. Again, though, we, we might hypothesize potential hiccups that can arise. Nothing feels eminently egregious, though, like it's the end of the world, especially since there's this admonition to live as God's slaves, as people first and foremost who are yoked to the gospel plow of the Messiah, Emmanuel, the bright morning star whose yoke is easy, come on, y'all know this with me, and whose burden is light. Whatever entity on earth we submit to then is, is based only off having already waved the white flag of surrender to Jesus, which delivers the impetus and the context for doing good in this way that might compel the spiritual conversion of an authoritative figure. Surely, <laughs> although substantial disagreements may exist between us and, let's say, a Donald Trump or a Justin Trudeau or a less than desirable supervisor or whoever else, for good reason those disagreements may exist. Nevertheless, we know how to honor and to show deference to the office or the position despite the scorn that we may hold for the individual in terms of how they lead or how they carry themselves. And then if you skip on down to verses 21 through 25, none of that as we read it is beguiling. It isn't anything that Christians would be unfamiliar with or that most Christians would contest. In Christ, yes, we, we know that whoever does not carry their cross Whoever does not follow him, Jesus, cannot be his disciple. No one can rightly wiggle their way out of the cruciform life of which suffering is a common denominator. Of course, if you go through the end of the passage, we follow Jesus' example in that he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Now, we aren't God like Jesus is God, but you, you get the point that we are called to lay our lives down in absolute concrete terms if necessary, despite that we have done nothing wrong. You'd be hard pressed, I think, to find someone who takes the Bible seriously, who would dare to negate what I've just explained straight faced who would show up with a notebook full of scriptures that they've written down in support of a Christian life that denies biblical suffering. But I need you to know that these people do exist. Verses 18 through 20, though, they're, they're a bit different. But I want to be clear in stating that the verses themselves, verses 18 through 20, they are fine. Do, do you, you hear me? That verses 18 through 20 are fine. It's, it's the way that we've sometimes interpreted these verses that's the problem. What I mean is scripture interprets itself. So while we need to ask the Holy Spirit for help always and often in understanding and application, we also have to put scripture in conversation with itself. What I mean is the Old Testament needs to be in conversation with the New Testament. Pastoral epistles or letters need to be in conversation with wisdom literature. The Psalms and historical books need to be in conversation with the synoptic gospels. Together, 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 not in siloed quarantine apart from one another. That's how we gain a fuller and corrected picture of what God meant back then, but also what God is conveying now. But without any of that, we, we're just left to our own vices of lust and greed and racial superiority, and, it, and we can find ourselves conveniently, sinisterly, cherry-picking passages to advance a cause that Scripture never authorized in the first place. For example, in years gone by, for centuries, verses 18 through 20 were used by even white people who were not believers, as well as white people who did identify with Jesus 
to justify a, a so-called manifest destiny of North American conquest. First, robbing indigenous people of their native land in the name of Jesus, as shameful as, as that is, and then importing Africans like stolen cargo to essentially, if we're going to be honest, build a nation off their backbreaking, innovative and free labor. Because God permits evil for a season or in some instance that is chronicled in the Bible or in our life today, it does not mean that God approves of it. In these verses, Peter is, is getting at a way to face suffering. If one receives a beating for doing good and endures it, then that carries forward Christ's sacrificial example. He mentions in verse 19 how commendable it is if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God, which is to say they aren't doing it to get girls, they're, they're not doing it to get likes or a lawsuit, they're not doing it to get riches or promotion or to prove some selfish point, they are merely pointing back to God by their behavior. And yet neither with this portion of scripture nor elsewhere in the Bible does God give a hearty amen about slavery. He just doesn't. Though it's, it's worth noting that the Greco-Roman slavery referenced in 1 Peter with its policies around debt peonage and its rhythms for manumission was more of an economic thing than it was a racial thing. The chattel slavery, on the other hand, that we're familiar with from the formative days of the United States coming into being is something altogether different. Don't get me wrong. I mean, there is something to when we find ourselves in situations beyond our control, when we're bound by someone, when we're bound by something that we look to establish a shalom type of conformity despite that all manner of misery is unfolding before us. And this is all to Peter's point. But the Lord God Almighty also sees the tears and hears the cries of his children and he responds, hallelujah, Jesus. And oftentimes he empowers them in the full balance of scripture to also oppose those in authority. And this is the thing, to do so rightly in Jesus's name. All the way from Memphis, Tennessee's Mississippi Boulevard Christian Church, this example of him lining, uh, which is rooted in the African-American tradition of the church from pastoral Daryl Pettis and the Boulevard Vocal Ensemble, I want you to listen to them because they put it much better than I can. I love the Lord, oh, yeah. he heard my cry. Oh. 
So think about it. Daniel defied earthly authority when that authority contradicted heavenly truth. You want another example? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego told King Nebuchadnezzar so respectfully and matter-of-factly, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. That's what they told him. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, king, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. You want another example? I'm, I'm, I'm glad to provide it. Queen Vashti and Queen Esther, both of them defied King Xerxes because, I mean, basically he was power tripping. And Yahweh, in his own ways, rewarded their advocacy. The same could be said about Mordecai and Haman. Moses bucked authority, in fact, repeatedly with Pharaoh. And the list goes on and on and on with back to our picture, perfect example whom we're called to emulate Jesus defying convention, Jesus did. He defied protocol, Jesus did. He defied the authority of his day. Jesus did. He said in Mark chapter 12, verse 17, you'll recall, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's and ultimately what belongs to God. I'm so glad you asked me. That's a very astute question. What belongs to God? It's one word, 10 letters. It's very easy to remember what belongs to God is everything, everything. I could put that in contemporary parlance, maybe with a colloquialism, and I could say what belongs to God is everything. Alongside a legion of others who advocated for a beloved community over chaos, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. chose civil disobedience in the name of Jesus, as did Frederick Douglass arguably one of the greatest orators humanity has ever known as he escaped from slavery in September of 1838. With the Bible as their North Star, in true Christian community and in submission to the Holy Spirit, individual Christians must discern what the Lord is calling them to do in a particular moment around deciding to oppose deadly or otherwise unjust authority or deciding to submit to it for the sake of the gospel. But please do not buy into this cheap false notion that the God we serve is one who, by way of some mystical, magical, divine delegation, co-signs misogyny, co-signs racism or colonization or rape or sex trafficking, or acculturation, or who co-signs genocide, and certainly not slavery. Its mere existence or persistence never means necessarily that God supports it. And if no one has told you, let me be the first to mention it today, in God's kingdom, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. It's it's upside down, y'all. The, the arrogance of man will be brought low and human pride will be humbled. In, in the meantime, in glorifying God, we have to display heavenly values among earthly transgressions that seek to run us off the road of obedience. Acknowledging is our job that what the enemy of God meant for harm or evil, God will use for good. To reference what the former First Lady Michelle Obama has said, when they go low, we go high. In a nutshell, whether the crafty, bold, cunning, and prayerful resolve to escape or to fight for freedom, or the crafty, bold, cunning, and prayerful resolve to remain is where someone lands. It encapsulates the marching orders that we can walk away with from 1 Peter 
chapter 2, verses 11 through 25. And as I close, if expressing that manner of clarity, these two options before God, as you try to do your best to discern being obedient in a particular moment, if expressing that manner of clarity brings your evangelical, your orthodox, your creedal, your fire baptized, Holy Ghost filled, blood bought card of Christian conviction into jeopardy of being revoked by whatever tribal power brokers exist in your sphere, then you probably have some work to do and you probably have some potential moves that you need to make to better honor the God of the Bible. There is no life hack to completely avert suffering. You and I must face it with God's help in submission to God's word that exists to guide God's people. May the Lord our God be your anchor in joy and pain with you always to the very end of the age. Amen.